Hey everyone, Alex Miller at Capney on here. I'm very excited to announce that over the course of quarter four, we'll be doing a bit of a mini course through these LinkedIn videos. And the point of the mini course is I'd like to give everybody a whirlwind tour of what are increasingly being lumped together as privacy enhancing technologies or PETs. The function of this video is I'm going to give a whirlwind tour of a whirlwind tour of what's out there and what can you expect from this mini course over the course of the next few weeks. After this initial video, the later videos are going to be deeper dives on particular technologies. And then deeper dives on applications. And I, I don't want to just talk about application in the slightly more technical sense, but what are the business problems that these things can maybe solve for people? And I would like to be, you know, I'll be frank, particularly cynical about where does the value for your organization potentially really come from if you choose to employ some of these, what I think are really exciting new technologies. Okay, so here begins my whirlwind tour. There's roughly three broad categories of PETs in my judgment. There are encryption-oriented methods. They sometimes get a pretty edifying label of encrypted data in use. The idea is you can do some kind of useful work on data that stays encrypted the whole time and therefore limit risk or obey a compliance rule, etc. Similarly, there's a different group of methods that you have a sensitive data set you don't want to share, it can't go here, it can't go there. You can employ an algorithm to generate a new data set that is hopefully more private, protects whatever secrets were in that original data set, but people analyzing it will get the results they needed. So these first two categories I know pretty well, that's my wheelhouse. This is the kind of thing my company advises people on how to use and adopt. I will talk briefly about the third category, which is roughly the secure enclave trusted execution environment world. Okay, so the encryption oriented sector, all these things I'm going to talk about have big scary names. And part of what I'd like to do as part of this course is debunk a little bit what these big scary names are and how you should really think about these things. Names, of course, are also mutating very quickly. So first, homomorphic encryption. This is the most faithful to this encrypted data and use term. The idea is that you can give somebody encrypted data, they can do some kind of processing it on it while it's encrypted without any need of decryption. This is great for, for example, if I was in Europe and I needed to send data to the US, there are legal problems with that lately. You could look up Maximilian Schrems to learn about it. I could use a technique like homomorphic encryption to send that data to the United States. Stays encrypted over there. I didn't break European law. Just whatever answer I needed to get computed comes back. So next, secure multi-party computation. This is very similar. I personally would say when you read the papers about these things, it also flirts with being a sort of encryption. But the difference here is it's not, well, I have a key and you have some ciphertext. And it's worth noting this conventional encryption paradigm is really, we kind of broke something into two pieces that are each useless on their own. And the difference here is there are more pieces and more actors and they're all kind of equal. So maybe a consortium of different companies that don't really trust each other would like to collaborate to compute something that summarizes something about all of them, but they don't want to share the constituent data to do this. This is fertile soil for a technique like secure multi-party computation. Zero knowledge proof is another one. This is very influential in the cryptocurrency and blockchain world right now. The idea is that you can prove you have some kind of provenance or you can prove you have some kind of credential. So approximately the story in the cryptocurrency world is what's the point of the blockchain originally? It's to solve this double spend problem I'm going to somehow prove to you that my ledger saying I have this much money is all legit, but I don't want to tell you my life story and show you my whole ledger. And that's something that can be accomplished with zero knowledge proof. I think especially, just to point out here, homomorphic encryption, if you include the paper that says that it works, 
is actually a zero knowledge proof in that I have a piece of ciphertext and a piece of ciphertext. I'm proving to myself that some new ciphertext is those two whatever is added together. Likewise, I have never read through a, an approach to zero knowledge proof of detail. It didn't have something that was vaguely homomorphic encryption inside it. All right, next. New data set methods. So first I'm gonna lie a little bit about synthetic data. One thing you can do to make a data set more private is just add some noise to it. Differential privacy is really a particular metric for what is private enough and a mathematical theory of how much noise you have to add. But in practice, this theory allows you to, yeah, just noisify this data set and now we have confidence that we have protected people's privacy well according to an appropriate definition. So as, when I get to that in more detail, I will talk quite a bit about, well, there's this very fancy mathematical theory, but a lot of implementation is you just add some noise. Synthetic data is another one. The idea here is much more directly, we are using some kind of machine learning technique to cook up a new data set. And we would like that new data set to be faithful to the original data set for somebody else that wants to analyze it in a particular way. So I'd like to do some very quick pro and con here. These encryption oriented methods are superior in a sense that they give you exactly the right answer. And then the drawback is that it's a little harder to work with in one way or another. Sometimes it's computationally slower and then you need to implement a fancy algorithm to manipulate the encrypted data. When you're working with these new data set methods like synthetic data and differential privacy, on the plus side, it's just regular data. You could give it to an analyst and you don't have to tell them even maybe that it's synthetic. They can just plug it into their favorite tool like they would anything else. There's nothing real new about how to handle it, except that maybe you're getting the wrong answers. And depending on the original data you're trying to protect, the sophistication of the algorithm, especially in the synthetic data case that you're using to create the new data, maybe you're getting the wrong answers and it can even be pretty slippery. Like, why am I getting the wrong answer? And like, what can I say about the what the right answer should be? I should say that all of these things uh, may be the real reason that you use them is you're building a product and you think the people that use that product will find it differentiated and exciting because of these extra privacy features. In addition to maybe you're the one that's trying to contain risk or obey rules with the technique. So federated learning is an interesting boundary case and it's a good place to talk about how these blur together. Federated learning is more a goal than a technique. It's the modeling AI version of this world. The idea is we have data in different places. We don't want to pool it. We don't want to share it, but we want to come up with some model based on all the data. And federated learning will typically leverage different techniques of the sorts I've mentioned to achieve this. To clarify a little bit, perhaps you want to create a logistic regression model. There's a couple different ways you could use federated learning to get this model. One might involve homomorphic encryption to protect data. Another might involve differential privacy to protect data. It's exactly the same, maybe barring a little bit of noise and error, exactly the same logistic regression model at the end as if you'd pulled all the data, but you did it in this private way. So once again, this is sort of a goal. It's not a privacy technique per se. Finally, trusted execution environment. The idea is that you have a special little zone in the hardware of the device that's doing these computations. Data maybe travels into that area encrypted in some way. There's probably a special layer of your operating system to go with that special area of the chip. And all the juicy stuff is only going to be revealed inside of that chip. So once again, your data is protected. It's kind of like a small hardware clean room 